Hey everyone, Joe Glines here, and today I'm talking with uh, Gabriel Cook. Um, Gabe and I go back, actually I was thinking about it, um, almost 20 years now, um, and we, we met in Georgia, I was getting my master's in market research, he was getting his doctorate in cognitive psychology, and what was funny is we lived in the same really tiny apartment complex, and we both happened to work with SPSS and did statistics, and actually now I think about it, you, you I think, because you also use syntax, which like was yeah. so, so rare, right, like, like, I mean, nobody does this. And so we instantly got to be friends and, and, and hung out. And over, you know, nearly 20 years now, we've been sharing code and syntax. Um, and, um, and then I guess around, around 10 years ago, somewhere in there, um, um, I started looking at AutoHotKey and we started playing with it. But um, we'll get into that here in a minute. Gabe, why don't you give everyone a little bit of your background of um, education and um, programming experience? Okay. Um, well, I'm a professor of cognitive psychology. Uh, my area of research is memory. So a lot of the things I'll probably talk about today will be related to how I might use auto hockey for um, either uh, teaching purposes um, to simplify my, my work teaching um, or also to simplify the process of, of doing uh, research itself. So I've been a professor now for um, about 13 years. Um, and yeah, I basically started using auto hockey around 13 wonderful years, Gabe. Yeah, 13, 13 wonderful years. Uh, and, uh, and luckily, I've, I've known you for most of that time. And that's how basically I got involved in, in auto hockey. Um, but my, my specialty area is, is memory. And basically what we do is we ask questions about variables that may influence memory. And we use statistics to answer those questions. So as you were saying, you know, we use SPSS or some other data analytic tool like R or Python to be able to answer those questions. Um, in terms of my programming experience, that's a whole different other question. Uh, I haven't been doing that as, as long. I've taken no formal training or courses in computer science. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I've learned has just been through my own experiences. And uh, it really did start with SPSS, as you mentioned, we were using um, syntax. Um, basically, my graduate school advisor would not look at any of the data for our experiments unless he saw the syntax first. That's a brilliant uh, way to force people to do it. That's interesting. Well, that's, yeah, I was thinking about, uh, about that when I, was, when I was thinking about this uh, interview. And one of the things is, is trying to force people to do something they otherwise wouldn't do. And I think that's kind of like the stumbling block of maybe why some people don't get involved in using auto hotkey or programming themselves because they feel like they don't need to. And so um, that was a really good experience because we would have just used the GUI dropdown and, and done analyses uh, over and over and over, and I study memory, so I know memory is fallible, and then you forget what you did, and then you get more data, and then you try to redo it, and it becomes just a big nightmare. So, so looking at the data from a syntax perspective makes the absolute most uh, sense, but, but we were required to provide the syntax before, um, well, in the early days, uh, until he was confident that we could actually provide accurate data. So he thought looking at numbers that he wasn't confident in was just a waste of his time. And I still uh, hold that belief today. So really just started with using SVSS uh, syntax, which... Let me add on a couple of things here, by the way, because the other thing I think the syntax does is it forces you to really think about what you're trying to do. Because in a GUI, you've seen kids, they just keep clicking and clicking. You're doing all these crazy stuff that makes no sense. And with syntax you really have to think through like, what am I putting in here? What am I going to run? It's just a little more, it yeah. forces you to think about it, right? No, absolutely. I've seen, I mean, I teach statistics too at the colleges and I've seen students use SPSS, although SPSS has gotten better over the years to prevent you from running the incorrect analysis. Um, when you don't know what you're doing, it can become very dangerous and you point and click and it runs an analysis and you look at the output and you interpret it and it's the wrong one. Yeah. So when you're coding things out, you really have to be a lot more careful of, of, of that. Um, in fact, when I was in graduate school to try to help incoming graduate students, I created like a little tutorial 
to walk the students through of how to use SVSS and even syntax alone because none of them coming out of undergraduate had any, any experience doing any programming in SVSS because that's just not how it's taught. Wow. And, uh, and so I created a tutorial that would walk through a typical data set type of question that we would have for the lab and it would walk them through like what we need to do step by step what you need to do and as you're saying you kind of have to be very conscious about that process one of the things that i did in the code was i built in an error and uh so so one of the things that was that was built in there was just creating some kind of uh, ratio in terms of memory performance so it could have been for example remembering you know 10 out of 20 words um, but if that denominator is coded incorrectly and it's 19 or it's an actually a 2 because you forgot to put the 20 uh, in there for the denominator, it can really change the, the interpretation of the data. But I made it very subtle. It was just off by like one, one uh, integer. And um, the only way to capture that mistake was to look at your minimum and maximum values in your descriptives and you would actually see somebody perform beyond what was reasonable <laughs> and uh, I was just looking at some data that my graduate student sent me today and I'm just or I'm sorry yesterday and one of the things I said is I need to see the mins and the maxes because I really don't know what the what the range is and if there's something odd there again the mean even though it looks like it makes sense is is completely meaningless so so it was, yeah, it was a, a fun experience trying to get to know SVSS and then um, probably about uh, five or six years after that too, um, you and I started using AutoHotKey to simplify some, some things in, in SVSS, but also we started using the macros in SVSS. Well, yeah, let's, let's stop there because um, I know if, I don't know how, I don't remember how long it was. This was quite a while ago. I'd like say at least 10 years ago, maybe more. Uh, I started using macros and I'm like, I kept trying to get you to, I'm like, use macros. You're like, no, no, I, I do something to every time. It's not applicable. And I'm like, no, <laughs> let's just, let's just do one. And, and we tried for a while. And then I forget, like, I think I came over or you came over. Um, and, and I'm like, no, this is what we're doing today. We're going to do this. And like, and then you're like, well, you're, you know, you're, you didn't fight it. Right. But we're like, okay. And then you're like, oh my God, like I, I'll use this all the time, right? It was, yeah. but again, I didn't. Something that I otherwise probably wouldn't have done. And that's, well, but that's again, I look back and go, you know, granted what, what people don't understand is how I use SPSS was very different than how the statistics you use were very different than what I use. So I couldn't just run something and give it to him and say, here, this is, this is how you do this because yeah. he uses very different things. But that was what I should have done, right? Instead of just saying, you really got to use this cool thing, it was, that's what we did, right? We broke down an example of yours and then you, then it was like, oh, wow, I see it, right? And that was one of those, like, I've, I think about it with auto hotkey is that first example, when you demo something to them, the more relevant you can make it to them, the more they'll see the power and the value, right? Um, and that's a big one. Um, yeah. The second one, which I was going to say was it's, it's not quite formal training, but, um, it's one of those things that make that you and I were, were so similar on besides being cheap, right? We're both incredibly cheap, but, um, is the, um, we, we, we often, you know, almost not every year, but close to it, take what, like, a, you know, anywhere between five, five days, six days out of the year where we call it a codecation, right? We get together and we'll work like 12, 14 hours a day where we are just side by side figuring out how to do stuff, um, and how to solve things and, in in the learnings that, that I know I've gotten from from doing that, where we're both sitting there and we can ask questions. What would have been great is if we had an expert, right, that could have <laughs> been yeah. helping us. But yeah. it was that struggle that made yeah. us actually learn it too, right? So, but yeah. but my main point was like, not to brag, but I'm like, look, we took our vacation time, you know, not every year, but close to it, and spent a week, you know, working long hours to learn how to be more efficient, you know, and whatever. And it's just. Yeah so rare you run into anybody who's interested in, in like investing in themselves. Right. And, and, and you know what I hadn't thought about, it's kind of like working out too, right. When you have a buddy doing it, yeah, it's much easier to, to commit to it and you stick to it instead of saying, well, I'll take some, a couple of days here and do this. And then, you know, it, it almost never works out. You got other stuff to do. Yeah. So I think part, the, the economists would call that some kind of commitment device and that kind of yeah. keeps you honest in order to, 
uh, to follow through on those on those goals. And that was just our way of doing it and developing a plan. What were the things we were going to try to work on? And yeah, we've we did all different sorts of uh, stuff: auto hockey and SPSS, and when we were learning Python. Um, and and maybe sometime I'll get you to to play around with R. I'm just well, so that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he laughs because I've I've given I for the most part as much as I did it most of my professional corporate career, except for the last for like five to eight years. Um, I try not to touch statistics anymore. I'm just bored yeah. with it. Um, so I don't have. But but also actually that that Python right. We we took that one year and we were trying to get to use Python to do to replace SPSS because Python is free and open source and so many things about it. And um, we, it wasn't at the time, it wasn't quite there for what either of us needed. Um, it was still a good learning experience, but, um, but yeah, R, R is not a, from my understanding, a fun programming language to learn. Um, and again, an R for the most part is almost all just stats. It's not quite, but it's much more statistical. Whereas Python, you have so many other applications to it. Uh, but yeah. I was trying to see, I realized I had written down some, some different questions for you and I pulled up the other questions. Um, but um, so I'm, let me find them. But I know one of them is, is so besides with me and you and I, which I don't want to get into this, but we found a way because we both, we shared so much code. We mm -hmm. made it where I could copy something and give it to him and the path would work on his computer and vice versa. Um, it was, it's, it's, it sounds simple, but it was really much more complicated. But what I'd love you to, to talk a little bit is about um, working with other, besides with me, right, with other people. And then I, I know you've done stuff with AutoHotKey, but can you, I, I don't know all the ins and outs of stuff. What, what have you done with them and, and how do they feel about AutoHotKey? Do they even know they're using it? Um, well, some of them do and some of them don't. And some of them have still probably not really made things as easy as, as they could be. Sure. Uh, so as Which, as building, we're not going to knock, right? I mean, oh, no, no. Yeah. I mean, everybody levels. has yeah. their, their way of, of doing yeah. some things. And I was just building a new computer and, and I was just, you know, thinking about setting it up and how it's set up. And, and some of the, the stuff that I have shared on, on Dropbox or, or, or some other platform like that, um, Google, it just makes me wonder whether or not I even need to reset that back up because I don't really have that many people um, kind of uh, collaborating in, in that same way. Um, but as a, as a data scientist or research scientist to answer the questions, um, one of the things I did want to comment is um, I luckily have not had uh, the same kind of restrictions that some people have in some jobs. Yeah. and they can't use certain programs. Um, we are given to some extent admin privileges uh, for different software. So running auto hockey has not been probably the same kind of problem uh, that I've had uh, or other people have had, um, at least for me to deal with. I've been able to circumvent that. But I certainly do have a handful of things that I can't do on, on the computer. Um, right. And an auto hotkey has, has helped me kind of get around those. Um, so uh, one of the things, um, for example, is, is the monitor is supposed to lock up after some period of time of being away from it. So, you know, trying to figure out a hack to be able to get that to work. And, and what I think we probably even talked about this was just doing something as simple as moving the mouse and yep. wiggling the mouse. Yep. So, um, so I threw that on a timer and then it would just, you know, move the mouse uh, before the time ticked up. And then I was able to come back to the system without having to log in um, because uh, because the lockdown on our computers, every time you do it, you have to log back in. Yeah. And you can't create a, an auto hotkey uh, hot combination because it doesn't work in that login window. <laughs> so you can't even put your password or something like that in a hotkey and correct but, if I'm wrong um, on yours, if I remember right, because it, it doesn't just, it moves the mouse, but it moves it back, right? So if you're actually yeah. doing stuff, it, um, it doesn't mess you up. Yeah, it only moves probably about 10 pixels in the back or something yep. like that. It actually just, it just, uh, just takes an XY coordinate wherever it yep. is and then, and then adds some coordinate and then returns it back to whatever it was, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, Sorry, but I was going to say, because yeah. I realized when I went through my stuff, because I'm not in corporate America anymore, but, you know, I have my locker where I'm, I was the reverse. 
-hmm. I didn't have the thing, but if I walked away from my computer and didn't lock it and someone came by, I could get a ticket and I forget how, what the, you know, it mattered, but they would go to your manager and say, Hey, such and such. So I had it where I could hit a hotkey and it would kill my monitors and no one could do anything unless you hit the right hotkey to, to bring it back. And that prevented me from having to log back in, which is what you just said. Right. Yeah. Um, which is of course why it hates us, but, but that's, <laughs> yeah. um, but but auto hockey, yeah, it's been um, it's been a lifesaver in, in a couple of different ways. And, and the way I view life as somebody who answers questions about memory is that I just think about auto hockey is a is a way to deal with the fallibility of memory. There's so many things uh, when we first started using it, or when I first started using it, um, I was using it for simple things like text expanders and so forth. Um, and I won't get into that because I know you have particular questions that you want to ask uh, about that. But the one way I think about this and how I've used it is just uh, apply it to thinking about things that I would actually forget to do. Uh, even though I study memory, my memory is pretty bad. And so you come up with ways that, that the environment can you know, support you in, in that retrieval process or, or simplify things that may be annoying for, for you to do. Um, and that's kind of how I've started using uh, auto hockey. So I can't remember exactly what, what, what exactly that question was that you well, asked. I, yeah, me either. But um, what I was going to say was, but, but with the whole thing you were, you were talking about how memory and how you use it. But I think also that's, that's one of the things I love, even though, like you said, it's a simple thing between the hot keys and hot strings. But both of those things, the triggers, right, whether it's the multiple text or the combination key combination, what's beautiful about it is I can make it meaningful to me, intuitive to how my brain were, how I think. And that's what's so awesome is like in Word and stuff, yeah, you have hotkeys, but you don't get to set them, right? And they don't, they're not necessarily meaningful for you. And, and when you can make it meaningful, it's so much easier to remember them. Yeah, and actually that reminds me of, of the main question that you're asking is how I, how I collaborate. With oh yeah, people. right. So, um, so some of the things that I do, uh, with with auto hotkey is maybe I have some uh, some different code snippets that I sh that I share or uh, I know I we, you talked earlier about sharing something on a path and so um, or or a file we turned a, f uh, a folder or directory structure into a drive letter um, and then that drive letter was basically the same for both of us one of the things that I I also did in auto hotkey to simplify things was rather than attaching uh, documents to email which is the just the whole process of then you have to download the document and yep. then you have to open it up and everything is what i what i created was just a simple script that would you know you paste the path into the email and right. then somebody highlights the path and then they press a couple keys and that just basically copies the path and then opens it up if you're using windows obviously uh, it, it opens it basically explorer will open up any file in the default program that it wants to open it to. So really, it's just passing the path into Explorer and then the file opens. So that was one way to kind of simplify sharing documents that were already on their computer, say on Dropbox, um, but they didn't necessarily know it was there or you didn't have to tell them, hey, it was in this folder, go look for it. It's just like, here's the path that's already on your computer here, open it up. And that was to share uh, data outputs or, or syntax or, or some other uh, things. One of, the, one of the other limitations that I have is, um, I do probably have a little bit more flexibility with my computers in terms of admin rights and some of my colleagues have, they can't install like anything uh, at different schools. But some of them are, are a lot more uh, hands-off related to any kind of uh, programming, whether it be Python or, um, yeah, or R, for example. And so what I, what I put on, on in AutoHotKey uh, and using Dropbox was basically a directory structure that had all of those um, mm. libraries and packages and everything. So running a portable version was great because you didn't have to have it installed. And as long as they had the files downloaded on their computer, they could just click to the program and everything would open up. And I would manage the libraries, so they would never have to do it. And we were all working from the same, uh, same software, essentially, that I was just maintaining for, for them. Um, but there's been, um, 
you know, there's been very few of them who have kind of gotten on board with that. My graduate student is a lot more on board. We do some of the same things as you and I do, which is uh, you, you wrote your program to uh, share information on the clipboard. And so I, I do that with him as well to share different code and so forth. Um, yeah, just to clarify, you know, like he could hit copy and the other guy can hit paste and it, it, it goes across the computer. So it's, it's just leveraging a network drive where you've saved the clipboard data to the, the drive and then they pull it in to the memory. And anyway, it's, all, it's a, when you're collaborating, it's really, or if you have a laptop that you're, you're constantly using and you, you have a URL that you want to go to, man, it's super helpful. Absolutely. So that was uh, kind of how I work with with some of my my colleagues and and because they didn't install auto hockey because they either couldn't or it was just a mental barrier to even yeah. using this foreign thing that I'm going to have to code in. One of the great things about auto hockey was the ability to just compile the program. Sure. And so all I would do is I would put stuff up, obviously do it on Dropbox or some other sync platform. Uh, because they're execut executables and you can't send those in email. So again, you just share the stuff on, on, on that and, and then everybody could, could access things uh, uh, themselves. So. Didn't you actually have something that, would, that automated that compiling? To, I, I forget, it did, it did a little bit more because yeah. it like brought in the images or something. I forget what it was. Yeah, I did. God, it's, it's been so long since, yeah. since I've done that specifically, but um, but I did do that. And, and basically in one of my startup scripts, I just had to go through those main scripts. And if there was any changes, it would just, you know, recompile them um, in that particular stage. And then it would add the images and, and so forth. Yeah. I remember uh, one of the, um, the, the sound APIs, the SAPI uh, yeah. built into windows. Uh, I, you know, I, I passed a, a good morning text to my colleague Paul when he started. I, I remember, yeah. When he, yeah. When he started up his computer, and so you know, he he, he was a little freaked out by <laughs> by that, but um, you know, it, but but the nice thing was is like any changes or tweaks that I made to the codes that we were using, um, they were all able to deal with, and I didn't have to then yeah. put up new. Uh, you know, new new software for them to download or anything like that it was it was the nice thing about sharing things over some kind of uh, Dropbox or Google or some other kind of uh, network. Um, and I do the same thing for my lab too. I kind of treat my lab as as oh, a different yeah. colleague, and so all the software uh, is is right. there as well. So, you know, if I have something working on my on my computer at home or which now I just built, um, or my my laptop for school. You know, it's just it's just so much easier to just have things all conveniently laid out in different but places. And explain though, because when when people hear your lab, they're thinking you have a computer in the lab. Explain what how you're re referencing it when you say your yeah. lab. Yeah, I'm sorry. So um, so as a as a cognitive psychologist studying memory, basically what we do typically is uh, bring participants into a laboratory. There's different rooms. Um, each one has a computer or two, and they sit down. We expose them to pictures, words, sounds, or some other kind of stimuli. We give them some task. It kind of keeps them engaged in, in what would simulate like everyday activities. And then we need to test their memory. So that software is written um, for the experiments. is different, written in different types of software. And so then uh, we're collecting data on, on the lab. Uh, um, along the lab computers. And so, you know, if I'm using R, I want to have R or, or uh, we luckily we have SPSS installed on our campus computers, um, but uh, trying to get R installed on, you know, 15 different computers was, was kind of tricky. And then also having all of your, uh, your, your hot, I'm sorry, your, yeah, your hot strings or your uh, spelling corrections or, or, uh, text expansion for doing all the coding and everything. It's uh, it's just then all uh, used really either over the network or on Dropbox or 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 something else. Because one of the things that I've I found even transitioning in with to to R is the forward slash backslash issue in pads and um, R Linux. You know. Uh, 
Mac OS, uh, they all have the, the forward slash and Windows has the backslash. And so, you know, just something as simple as copying a path, which yeah. program you're in, you know, I've made uh, auto hotkey detect which window you're in. And if it's in cool. a certain window, then it automatically swaps the, the slash. Uh, That's for awesome. me because it's just, you know, who wants to go through and <laughs> change yeah. <laughs> when it's you know when, when it's several when it's several uh, directories deep it's just a real a real inconvenience yeah. so so having all that stuff on all the labs uh, was you know was really helpful and then of, of course too um, for purposes of Dropbox or, or Google or something uh, it also means that the software is, is exactly the same but that's not a you know that's not an auto hotkey uh, issue um, but yeah, actually related to auto hockey though, is then how do I get all the files to where I need them to go? I mean, I have my own directory structure, but I need to replicate certain parts of that directory structure, not everything, right. like not all of my programs, not all of the folders within next nested folders and so forth. Uh, but what I, what I ended up doing, and I know you probably ask about, ways that we've used auto hockey and things that we've written is I wrote my own um, backup software and uh, and I've customized that over the years to make the backup process easier I know I know that there's backup and sync software that, that exists the problem is uh, it doesn't work exactly the way I want it to work or it's too complicated or it requires downloading and installing something else and you can't make any changes <laughs> Or it's too broad, right? You can't be specific enough. Uh, it's just going to copy everything. And I know that's where you're like, I don't want all the images or whatever. I want, like, we did this with our, you know, auto hotkey and SBSS. Like, I can back those things up in a breeze and nothing else, you know. Yeah, so I, so I wrote um, a program that uh, then I just basically can determine which paths I want to have copied and where I want them to be copied to. And that runs on startup too. So anytime that I change anything on my computer uh, or in my personal drives, it will will make changes to uh, to those other drives that I'm sharing with with other people. It does mean that I have to have a, an exact replica of of my you know R distribution, but uh, I think it's just the convenience because if somebody does something within that R distribution and it's my main distribution, then I have other problems because they you know, they've deleted something that I thought was there. And, and so, um, but I wrote a, a fun program to, to do that. And it's got a lot of flexibility and, um, and I'm, yeah, I'm fairly happy. It's pretty lean and simple. I, I wish you, you, you alluded to her a minute ago here, and I wish I had thought of asking this in all my other interviews, but, um, and, and at least first off, how many, Auto hockey scripts, do you have automatically started when you when you boot up? How many get launched? Do you think? It doesn't have to be exact, but is it more uh, than one, right? Oh, it is more than one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do I basically have a startup script uh, that runs and then that calls other scripts. Um, so yeah, um, and that one one startup script uh, also changes my uh, uses the substitution command. Although with Windows 10, I've been running into a little bit of issue with that. Um, but it, it calls different uh, directory structures as different drive letters because I just like to reference something off a of drive. And, and I could also, uh, when I share stuff with other people, yeah. their directory structure will be different will be different than mine because the user's different. And so uh, we can all still be uh, basically using the same uh, base drive letter. Uh, and then it calls up uh, other scripts that, you know, are my, my main one. But if I'm looking here, it looks like I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, at least, at least seven. And some of them, some of them just, run and then they close once they've gone through a, a certain process. Right. So, yeah. Um, out of any of those, um, if you're comfortable with it, can you describe just what they do? You don't have to get into how it works, but just here, here's what this one kind of does at a high level. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the one is my, my main script that includes all my text expansion. So, um, 
you know, phone numbers that I might use, emails that I might reuse, addresses, or um, when I send emails to certain, you know, I'm going to start populating this for my new my new set of students is is the emails. Um, so yeah, I could add all these emails to you know some kind of group or something like that in Outlook. Yeah. But if I could just put it's, it's all so the emails easy. into a yeah. you know into some text expander or something, it's right. easy to auto populate. Um, it you know it's my main script that calls you know calls other scripts. Um, one of them is is just the the simple what we kind of started with back in like gosh was it yeah 2008 or 2009 when you first introduced me to auto hockey was it just this the spelling you know yeah. replace and yeah, how much time, yeah yeah how much time is just wasted oh, in terms of correcting your errors well, or not even knowing you made an error right and and you just look stupid or, yeah or, uh, uh, so so one of those scripts is just my my spell checker and uh, I think my spelling and my type spelling has actually gotten worse over the years, perhaps because of it, <laughs> because I'm still surprised the number of errors that I make. Oh, it's, it's uh, crazy. Yeah. But yeah. So either my, my, my fingers are move, moving. I have maybe, maybe a, a motor problem that's changed as I've gotten older and I can't, you know, I'm in, interposing uh, uh, different letters uh, and spelling things incorrectly, but you know, it's, it's very common once a week, I'll probably add a new, a uh, new word or something like that to to the spell checker, um, or you know other things that that aren't really spelling things, but anything that I just want to have automatically uh, you know replaced or something. But one of them is that, and and that's you know that alone is like a reason to use auto hockey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it works in anything, right? Your email or instant messaging. Oh gosh, yeah. Whatever, yeah, yeah. it's 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 such a help. Yeah. You know. One of one of them is for um, I have a data science one that I've created, so that's the one that will do certain things with changing paths and everything. Why did I not put it in my main script? Is because I don't share my main script yeah. with people. So the ones that I think about as as functionality to share with others are there are separate skip scripts. So um, so my main script will basically uh, will call call that, um, but that's the one that has. Um, the path changer but um, one of the the things that i first started doing with 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 you anyway was just using the text expansion and every time i started a new data project i realized the top of the code would start the exact same way yeah once we started building all of our macros in SPSS, then it was just like okay well you have to call the file that has those macros so where is that? What's the file path? What's the name of it? How to do it? And then there's another one. And then there's another one. I used AutoHotKey also to, uh, this was before I started using R, um, and I didn't know all of the intricacies of, of SPSS, but I basically created an AutoHotKey script to take my individual data files for each participant, because each participant would have their own you know, data file. Um, but then I have multiple data files that I need to combine down. Um, and rather than running through a loop and appending each one in SPSS, which was kind of hard to do, yeah, um, I would just write an auto hotkey script that would go out and get, um, get the files of a particular name. Uh, and usually there is four different naming conventions that I would use for different types of files. Um, one would be, you know, for the test file, there's also... Um, other types of questionnaires that I'd have participants answer. So that would be in a completely different data file because it would have a different number of columns and rows and so forth. Columns mainly being the, the big problem, rows not, not being an issue. Um, so there are separate files and, and the, the code would just go and run through and merge everything together and then make a copy and put it in a backup folder. Um, so, so there is that. So it's like, okay, well now how do I call that file? And so that's another line of code to remember. And then there is other macros or something that were project specific that were not ones that I could just put into the macro call and, and have defined, but it would be, you know, one project is called Bob and the second project is called Bill or something. And so, um, you know, defining bill as being a particular, you know, path or something like that in SPSS was just a pain in the butt. So I basically would just have 
several lines of code that defined those those particular things at the beginning, and they would they would just be uh, a template that I would go and change, and and it was pretty simple uh, to change. So, so that I, I started doing, and then I started realizing once, oh, there was, remember that time when we, we started using SVSS uh, to write out code in SVSS? Yeah, yeah. Uh, because we found, oh, we could use macros not just yeah. to run things, but we could use yeah. macros to pass text of variables that would be dynamic and then right. be, they'd be changed. Right. So that's when I started doing the same. I, I, I took that... Uh, that program that would merge the data files, the auto hockey program that would merge the data files, and I popped that up a level to say, okay, but I don't want to have to take this file and do a search and replace of all yeah. the text on the screen, right. or I'm sorry, in the, in, the, in the code, and then recompile this. Rather, what I want is to create the code that allows me to choose what directory it is, right. And then like a variable. Other things. Yeah. So so now the program is kind of like a startup program that every time I have a new project, I also know that I have to have certain directories in that project directory. Yeah. Uh, There's a place to put the 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 program itself uh, to to collect the data. There's and a backup of that. There's a place for putting my data. There's other uh, macros and stuff that I might want to call for that. And so there's always a a certain directory structure. So then I, I wrote the auto hotkey script to first start with, hey, what folder do you want to create? Yeah. And then everything and, beneath it and with and it, everything yeah. beneath it would change. Yeah. It's automatic. And it, would, and it would also then, because it took the folder name and yeah. it knew everything else, right. would create the file that would later do all of the merging of the data for me. Nice. So so it's just like, why am I trying to do this? I mean, I could have gone into an old folder and copied them you know, from one directory to the other directory and then you know, clicked on each folder and changed the name and click, you know, yeah. and, it, and, that, and then they go into the folders and then delete the files and then update right. them. And I was like, oh my gosh. Right. This is just no. So no, I, um, I had something similar because I, I always had, I had a, a data folder, a syntax folder, a macros folder, a reports folder. Um, and then I think there was one other one, but yeah, like it would just generate all that for me. And I'm like, Oh, that was, that was so much easier, yeah. but I didn't have it looking at the paths of the syntax, which, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So then, so then once the, the, the syntax file was up there, you know, going back to the, the purpose of the text expanders, it's like, okay, I know what I need to, how I need to start out a file. And I type four letters and that throws out about 10 lines of code. And that's how I start out the file. Yep. So, um, and every file I know is is going to be uh, the same and correct um, whenever I change or modify the you know that name uh, text expander uh, call. So, um, so that's been just a lifesaver in terms of having consistency. It's one of the one of the ways to waste time too is just not knowing the directory structure of where your your files are for this project versus oh, that project. And it's yeah. always named the same. Right. So, um, so the way, I know you and I have talked about this over the years, the way we save files is, is completely different too. <laughs> it's so funny, yeah. You, yeah. you save files. Uh, it's all about the directory structure. The, the directory structure. To do with the name. And, yeah. I, and I've simplified the directory structure, right? So that obviously matters to me as well. But yeah. the other thing that matters to me is remembering how I name the file. Right. So I remember things. I don't that, have a clue on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so usually I never go to a directory to to find a file. Right. I search for the name and then get to the directory if I need to get something similar to that or uh, or or whatnot. And so one of the pieces of program that I use is called uh, Everything by uh, by Void Tools, and it's an indexer. Uh, so I turn off all the windows indexing of that. I actually don't need of all my files and everything uh, folders on, on the computer that just would take resources and indexing or whatever. And I've actually then changed the darn windows search, which I can't stand anyway. So when you press the windows key and, and um, e, e right. Or F to find F, it. F, so yeah, this is all 
uh, procedural memory for me. I don't, you know, it's where right. my hands are. It's like, yeah, wait, wait, what is it? No, it's not. You have to do it. Yeah. It's not yeah. S for search because that's safe. And um, yeah, so I use the find, right? The Windows F for find, and it takes you into that stupid little search thing that I, I find completely useless. So I've hacked that uh, to just replace that particular key binding to launch my everything program that then also puts the cursor exactly where I need it to be. Um, there's another key code uh, combination that I use that if I'm highlighted over text, it will actually copy the text and then it will put that in the search window so that I don't even have to type in the thing um, that, that I'm looking for. If I'm looking for a particular file path or something like that, um, and, and that's another way that simplified uh, the way I, I do that. And again, that's something, that piece of software too is a portable piece of software. So that's easy to, to just put in uh, on Google Drive or in Dropbox or, or some, well, I'm using Sync now. Um, but, uh, but put it in there and then you don't have to worry about ever installing it and it, it does everything exactly the, the way you want it to do. So, um, I'm trying to think uh, some some other some other things, but anyway, I, I'm curious. This I haven't actually, other than your student, your your main um, not your student, but your uh, grad student, right or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, do you do you ha, how often do your 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 actual class students ha show any interest in like in uh, any of the autom anything around automation or saving time? It doesn't even have to be using auto hotkey, right? It's just just the, the concepts that you've done, I mean, are, are they really help save a lot of time, but do you ever get any interest from kids in, in over like, wow, this is cool kind of thing and them using it or, you know, adopting well, it? Um, yeah, it's, it's, that's a good question. Uh, some things I just don't share because like your experiences, you just get people who yeah. this don't. And I wrote a piece of software. I'm going to step away and then come back. I wrote, for an example, I wrote a piece of software um, using uh, Calm, uh, the back end of, of most you know Windows well, uh, software. Actually, I was going to say was because um, that is one of the side notes. SPSS actually has a Calm under thing as well. You can you can connect to SPSS with Calm. We've I've played a little bit with it. I think I showed you some, but we've never done it full scale. No, anyway, yeah. but, but keep going. Yeah. So we would get our class lists that we could download from the registrar. Yeah. And it would da be downloaded in an Excel file. This was years ago, so things have changed a little bit. It was not in any useful format. Tons of stuff needed to be deleted, things yeah. needed to be changed. I remember seeing this stuff. Columns of stuff exactly were, 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 yeah. were named with stupid names. I yeah. mean, you, got, you have an engineer, fire. right? Yeah. An engineer who's building the software is not the user who's using the software, and so, so we download these files and they're completely ridiculous. And so I'm just like, okay, why am I messing with this? Why don't I write a program? And it probably took me more time to write the program than, than the time. The time, sorry about that. The time that it actually would save um, for, for me to, to work with it. But I also thought about you know, my colleagues and you know, if I did some work, I could save them time. So. Well, you, you know, I, I made the mistake of maybe thinking that that everybody yeah, else thought of right, the problem. Right. <laughs> well, and and but, hated doing it over and over every semester. Every semester day. for multiple classes. Yeah. Uh, yes. That, yeah. that, why would that be a problem? Right. Um, and so, yeah. So basically, changed the information. They actually even highlighted stuff. Made the made the the email links to be actual links that you could yeah. click on. That, <laughs> to send an email in, in, yeah. you know, in your email provider or whatever. Um, and, uh, and then anyway, I was, you know, I was on my way and I sent the software to all my colleagues and, and waiting. I, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. In silence. Yeah. And you know, I didn't hear anybody right back and, uh, it was probably a good year or something. <laughs> And somebody, uh, oh. one of my colleagues, um, I love her to death. She's she says, "Hey, your program's not working." So there was one person who was actually using, using it, it, and yeah. then it was it was kind of broken. She's like, "Oh yeah, this was so helpful." 
nobody else really ever ever, ever bothered yeah. Yeah. And, and so there's been a lot of instances of that showing people kind of trying to tell them how they can do this but um, I think the thing is unless you really make it executable and and everything that they can use it's just the whole idea that I'm gonna have to do this work and I'm gonna have to try to figure out how to uh, edit this um, it, it this may be a big turnoff um, so the students who I do get some kind of interest in are are more likely the, the computer science students so some of those uh, have heard of auto hockey but they never had like gotten into it um, but uh, other uh, other people uh, there's been a, maybe one other student who's who's actually tried it and started using it um, in what capacity exactly I'm not sure but a lot of times they, I don't even share that stuff with students because they yeah. they just you know they they don't have an interest I even tried teaching R uh, to my stats classes and I did it for two years um, and and there is really just a, a split. Some students loved it and half of the students hated it. And so it just wasn't worth the headache for me, um, despite a lot of them telling me, you know, this is what got me a job and so forth. So it's just, you know, one of those things that you kind of have to make them do or they're not going to do it. But then you're, you're fighting with the battle of, you know, so much in my industry kind of seems to depend on making sure people feel like they're, you know, class is fun and when you make it hard even though that skill can really pay off in the long run yeah. it's it's not as much a, um, a you know an endorsement to do that um, I would have stuck with it though but uh, I really didn't get support from my department chair either because he told me that people were complaining class was too hard uh, so I went back to doing it the old old-fashioned way and now there's some neighboring schools that are in our consortium that are using it and our students aren't. So, um, but there's a student in one of those classes two years ago and she uh, emailed me this, this summer and just the other day I helped her install R&R &R Studio on her, on her computer because she wants to use that and she, um, because that's what she's familiar with. So, and, and for her, she had never done any kind of computer programming before, and she probably would not have ever done it if, if I didn't expose her to that. But she knows that there's some utility in learning how to do some of those things, and so kudos for, for her. So, but it's kind of rare to get somebody who, who's interested in that way. I do have a lab, a student who works in my lab, and, and he was in one of the R classes and he's wanted to mess around with, with data in R. So we're a little off topic probably, probably with, with that, but it's the same kind of concept I think is yeah. trying to share stuff uh, right. and, and it doesn't work. I wrote a piece of software too, um, and I guess I, sh I should share this because it's not necessarily for me, and, uh, but it, it's to maybe give other people ways to think about how to automate things. Um, and you and I both look at the world in terms of why are we redoing this over and over and over? Um, one, one thing I noticed from my admin assistant is at certain times a year, she would collect information from faculty and students, and then she would have to compile that information and then send out emails mm -hmm. to all the students. And so what I, what I realized is, you know, those are just variables. The names are variables, the emails are variables, the advisor is a variable, the, the faculty advisor is a variable. Yeah, you have a general template with, yeah. the, it's the Mad Libs. The, which, but there's there's yeah. little things like you need to swap out, right? It, the, yeah. the content of the email is a template because she yep. didn't, she wasn't sending everybody the same email, but just think of an email that's sent, right? Sure. You, you have the name of the person you're sending it to. They, and this is for thesis projects. They have a name of a thesis. They have a thesis reader. Well, they, I was going to say there's chunks though that are, they're, 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 they're not goal. They're re, they're, the thing they're there for is they have a commonality, right? This is the degree you got, in, you know, here's the program you got accepted to, here's whatever. They have chunks of it that are the same. The content's different, but they have a placeholder thing that's, that, you know, in yeah. every one, they had that section, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was like, so we're, supposed to, yeah. 
which semester are you are you right. doing your thesis the fall semester or the spring semester yeah. or is it both right and so those are just little things that could you know be treated as variables uh, so what she was doing was she had like three different versions of a word document and then she'd copy it and she paste it in the email and then she'd edit it for that particular person and i'm just like this is ridiculous uh, so i wrote a program that would read in uh, a csv file that basically had all of those parameters um, that would then um, and each row was an individual, the name, who are you sending the email to, what is their email, who is the advisor, what is the advisor's email, and what is the version of the, the document that you would even send, and so forth. And then it would, uh, it would loop through, it would look at the content of the message uh, that needed to be sent, it would look at the variables for that, it would actually do a text replace yeah, it's a mail for that information, yeah. and it would then send the email automatically to the student, to the advisor, uh, and also back to the person sending the message. Yeah. And it was completely flexible that if you added more columns into that file, it would loop through the number, this is using com also, it would loop through to figure out how many columns actually had information in there. So it was completely expandable for things that you might wanna change. And the admin assistant actually never used it. But I have a new admin assistant. Uh, she was one of the ones who was going to do the, your your uh, quick access pop up. Uh, oh, cool! Yeah, with with Jean, right? And she just couldn't get into it. I think it was that day. But I told her that there's a new one coming up. Although that's yeah. the first day of the semester, so I don't think oh. she'll be uh, she'll be showing up for that. Um, but we're going to basically build her a Qualtrics. Uh, kind of uh, survey uh, uh -huh. then to to collect that information from people that would give her exactly the information that she would need that could be downloaded into that csv uh -huh. file or excel file that that now has everything exactly the way she wants yeah. it. qualtrics actually has a, a a decent api by the way um which you so you could even if you wanted to automate the going and getting of the data as well um, very well yeah, so, yeah that's one thing that i i haven't missed with um I've done it with Survey Gizmo. Yeah, and I, I saw. Have, I do have a token. I know I do have a token because I was test, trying to test out some stuff at one point in time. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing, though, I was I was going to say, kind of ironically, is it wouldn't surprise me when, when what you were describing here is like, oh, I, you get a list of all of the the names of the students and their email addresses and their degrees and their things, and people are like, I don't want to build that file. It's so much work. It's like, look, you got to build that file. You don't realize it. But no matter what, you got to have all that information before yeah. you send them all out. And the fact that actually, if you start breaking it down into chunks like that, that'll actually make you more efficient. You'll get all the emails at the same, you know, you, you fill this yeah. thing in, it, it'll be yeah. much more efficient. Yeah. And it goes so fast. I mean, once it's, oh, it's nothing yeah. through Outlook and everything, it, it's, it's just, it's so fast. And then, and that's the other thing too, is you'll kind of know when you sent those emails and they'll, they'll all be at the same time because the probability of another email popping up in that window of time you know, is, is probably very much reduced. So everything's basically got a very similar timestamp. Um, but yeah, I mean, I did that because, you know, the admin assistants at our school and, and, and you know, all over the place, they, they work really hard and, sure. and, and I don't think that they get great pay. And it's just, I, I see that with the things that they have to do repetitively and, you know, they don't, they don't really get that kind of uh, joy in, in doing those annoying things over and over again. But a lot of them may not even be able to, think about how it could be automated right which is the other thing is you and i look at the world probably very differently and why, are, we, do. why are we redoing god. these things yeah um I, I think i told you about the one where 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 john used to go for daycare their billing system was entirely separate from their contact system and so every week <laughs> one of my friends had to go go find what kids were there, like how many hours they were there this week and what the bill was, and then go to the other system and look up who the parents were and get their email addresses and manually do this. And so I wrote a program that, that it would export all the contacts and have them as a, a key, a unique ID, and then pull in the billing and automated the entire thing, and wrote these beautiful emails. And, and the manager's like, no, no, I don't, I don't trust that. No, we're not going to use that. Right. And it was like, this is, yeah, I, I it's crazy. Yeah. Which actually, so um, let's let's move into that one of like, why don't you think more people, you know, uh, either 
let's let's just start with even realize is it is it that they they have a lack of computer knowledge or is it i've been thinking part of it also is they just don't spot that they're really doing the same thing over and over right they think it's very different but in reality, it's not. And I, I don't think no one ever, you know, like we were never taught that, right? That like you're, you know, actually if you take some advanced business courses in like, um, what, what is it called? Uh, manufacturing and stuff, right? Production, mm -hmm. they'll break it down and they, they look for those things and they will get that workflow going, right? But yeah. in the real world, no one teaches that for like an office worker, but they no. really should yeah, because yeah, really should, yeah. that's how you start getting efficient, right? As you break things down like that. And now we've gotten better. I still will come up and realize like, well, crap, I'm doing this all the time. I gotta, I'm gonna write something to take care of this. But so do you think it's like, you know, uh, do you think it's the not being able to even spot that there's this thing or besides being aware there's a, a different solution out there or not having the, the, the interest in actually learning how to program at all? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, there's probably, I think there's probably at least two, two components is one is, is I don't, I don't think, like you said, there's really that training at, yeah. uh, in that particular job sector to, to even think necessarily about those things that are repetitions. Um, there's, well, actually probably there's two things. Then there's, and there's the other level of even, even realizing that that stuff could be automated. Right. And, and then it wouldn't I, be that know, hard, right? It, yeah, I know. I know as as time has gone on, a lot of the things I've automated only because I've realized, oh, I can automate it. Um, I guess another way to think about this is personally for me. You know, I grew up being, you know, uh, competing with two other brothers for food um, in a family that didn't have a lot of money, and you know, you, you kind of just ate what was available. You didn't question whether it was really good or not. I mean, we didn't, we didn't want to eat liver, but I mean, other, other than that, I mean, you didn't really question that much. And so when you think about it, it's like a chef, you know, a chef approaches a meal very differently. And when I eat something, it's just kind of like, does it pass the bar of like, is this, you know, is it, is it okay? But I don't think about, oh, should it use more salt? Or should it be um, yeah. yeah. Or should paprika, it be I should have, yeah. Or, yeah, some, yeah. Or, oh, I use, I mean, you can think about it as a chef, like if you use a certain combination of spices all the time, then why wouldn't you make a bulk set of those spices yeah. so that every right. time you don't have to re right. them out, right? And that is, that's really what we're doing with auto yeah. hockey is, is it's that repetition. Yeah. And, uh, and obviously, if you want to modify that recipe, then then you can't use you know the bulk that you've created. But if you never, I don't think if you if you have, don't know what to look for, I think I think some, well, I think that may be part of the problem is is yeah. is is not really knowing exactly what to look for because you really you, you really don't know how you can make it better. The other thing is when you talk programming, that's just you know that's why my students didn't like R. And you know, SPSS yeah. was more fun because you could just point and click. Yeah, so. it's actually the the guy John Ford. He's he's over in China. We had a, we had a really interesting talk, and and we were t he was bringing up you know it's another language, and actually if you think about it, like you learn Russian, you learn Chinese, you learn program you know computer programming, right? Auto hockey. If you think of it as it's a whole nother, it really is another literally a language, and you know everything it, it was really like so many things actually apply in that way like in order to speak it and understand it you have to learn and um also you know like for for us actually let's say if we were well it's still for us um learning like spanish or french or german isn't too hard right compared to learning chinese right or simplified chinese right that'd be like starting in c sharp right why would i start in the hardest language right yeah like start an auto hotkey it's so much easier to you can actually read the words and they kind of make sense it's not hard um yeah and i think that actually might be one of the reasons why uh, i kind of came along the way i did because i mean i find auto hotkey programming to be a lot more complicated than even coding anything in spss I think SPSS is very, you know, very straightforward. Compute this, set it equal to that, period. End of line, return, type in something else. When you want it to execute, you type execute. It's, I think it's pretty simple uh, for, for a lot of the things that, that people would 
would uh, potentially automate in that particular way uh, is very different than trying to get something maybe in, in Python or AutoHotKey or, uh, or R uh, to, to work. And so um, I think, yeah, I think that, that, that could be part of it. You don't want to start with the more complicated one, but you know, what is the simpler one? And even sometimes the simpler one is, is, is hard. Sure. Well, that's the other one though, that I, I thought I loved it was, um, if I'm going to start learning Russian or Chinese or um, Spanish, I, I, I'm not going to like go, Hey, I'll, I'll crack open a book for an hour once every six months, right? I'm never going to learn anything. But with computer programming, that's why I think the vast majority of people, they don't, they don't actually put in a program to learn, right? The vast majority, unless you're in school for it, you, you kind of, kind of do a little stuff here and there. And yet, if we really thought of it more of like, I'm going to learn auto hotkey and I'm going to have once a week, there's an hour, you know, twice, a, twice a week, even an hour a day. Like I, I think it'd be so much, people wouldn't be nearly as frustrated because you're investing enough of your time to make it stick and to, to yeah. work things through. Right. It's yeah. Yeah. Um, but I did talk to some of, uh, some of the admin assistants about uh, QAP quick access pop-up yeah. and, um, and they realized like, oh yeah, I'm always going to this folder oh, man. and then I'm going to this other folder. I, and I so wish I still worked in corporate world because that's the one thing I would say is I would be the biggest evangelist telling everybody uh, the, because yeah. we use network, these vast network drives with tons of links, right? And it would have been so convenient. Subfolder, subfolder, yeah. directory, directory, yeah. directory, and then you get to the file. Yeah. And then, yeah. And it's like you, they have maintained different different departments and then you have different faculty under different departments and then there's different years and it's just yeah there's different billing and when I bill this is what I always do and uh, I always go here and then I always go there and it's like okay let's let's try to simplify that so I think there is you know there's there I think there there is the noticing of things that they do over and over and over again yeah but they just might not even know that you could even change that I mean some of them do because then they're just like, oh, yeah, I just made a shortcut to my desktop yeah. for those things that I go to all the time. Yeah, I'm like, oh, okay. drive, Which, yeah, yeah. it's like, yeah, it's, it's still, it's something, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, and and that like, gets you there faster. Uh, but some of them don't, and then they click this folder, and then they go to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. And they do it over and over and over. Uh, so, um, so earlier you mentioned – something I, th I think it's interesting and I'm trying I, I think it's it's a relevant into corporate America as well as it was where you, you your example was your students telling I forget you said their advisors or the teachers or whoever but they were complaining about maybe it was R being too difficult right that they were having a harder time doing it, yeah, right? I, think it was, I think it was just the coding in general yeah so um, but but it's still it was it's interesting to me because that to me it's kind of like the inmates running the asylum right the here here are you in an academic you have like we're telling you like I don't I personally I mean and I know you don't have to comment I wouldn't give a shit right I'd be like this is you're here to learn you know we're, we're teaching you the, the best and what we think is this blah 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 um, and yet you have to change what you're doing because of their saying whatever, but I was realizing like in the workforce too, um, there's, there's never this push from the bosses. I, I always say like, well, how come like me, I would do this, but my bosses never cared, but then why don't the bosses actually get, you know, the employees to learn more. But I hadn't thought from the boss's perspective of like the employees complaining, right. And saying like, they don't get it or whatever. And, and I, I honestly, yeah, part of it is I think they just don't know what's it's even out there. It's a possibility. But yeah. even those that did, I honestly, I can see myself if I ever had been in, uh, I, you know, I was management a little bit at one place, but um, if I had a lot of employees and I tried to, I said, no, this is how you're going to do it. I can imagine like just having as bad a success as I did already with getting people yeah. to adopt it. Right. But, but if you know that that is for sure the way to go, because that yeah. is, it's going oh, yeah. to be, if I'm the boss, it's my company. Yeah. Oh, you're fired. Yeah. I, well, I, and, and not just, and, and, I mean, there's, I yeah. think there's different ways of thinking about it. There's, yeah. there's one is the, the way the boss might say, uh, well, this is the way it's done because this is why, how I think it should be done. Yeah. But if it's something like, well, in the long run, I know that my employees are actually going to be more efficient, which means they're going to be happier at their jobs. Um, and that means they're going to stay here longer. That means I won't have to search for new people. 
Um, you know, turnover in, in business is, is so costly it that uh, there's so much money that goes into job satisfaction research. And so, you know, it's just like, um, if you know as, as the business owner or the boss that those, what you're trying to get them to do are things that will actually lead to better outcomes, uh, then I think you certainly should stick with that, even though the, the inmates want to define, to define how you, the asylum should be run. And the, the thing that I ran into is um, I wanted to provide my students with an opportunity to learn something that was being used in these corporate worlds. So after the financial crisis, you know, businesses started thinking a lot more about how they were going to spend their money. And then that's, you know, that was probably one of the, the best things that could have happened for open source technology and R in particular is, wow, we can actually use this thing for free. It Quite requires so. a little bit extra work, but I think that's what happened in academics too. And you get a lot more students using R simply because the school's budgets didn't have the money for all the software. Yeah. And, and so what's happened as a function of whatever those variables were that drove this is now you have in businesses that could actually afford proprietary software, uh, organizations that don't have a lot of money because they need donor money for that software, uh, you know, those types of those places and even the home user basically would need something that doesn't cost much. And so what's happened is there's such a demand for people knowing those kinds of uh, languages, Python and R, for example, um, in that industry that um, you, you know, it, it, the industry has changed. So I wanted to provide my students with, I mean, I think about my goal is to teach my students skills that they can actually use in the real world. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Uh, so when I think about that and I see, you know, when I see reports of SBSS usage dropping and R and Python increasing, uh, I know that those curves will intersect at one point in time, at least the, the past data is suggesting that that's going to be the case. And I don't see a, a, a purpose of teaching students something that won't provide them with the skills to get their foot in the door as much as something else and um, and that's where the angle that I was coming from but my department chair either was not privy to the changes mm -hmm. in the market um, liked to do things the way that they have already always been done no matter what um, didn't want to deal with with students coming to him to complain that class was hard. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not exactly sure what it was, but but that's that's yeah that's what I was told, and and so rather than me then getting into you know debates with with my supervisor, I just said okay, yeah. so. If, if certain individuals believe that, that teaching students a useful, but perhaps maybe not the most useful skill is the way to go, even though things are changing, then I guess that's just, I guess the way it should, should be in, in, in this situation. But, um, but yeah, I think it really comes down to, I think, is whether the boss actually can embrace it as, as understanding. I know the previous department chair thought, thought it was a wonderful thing that I was doing, but um, she was a little bit more in tune, I think, with, with where things were going in the industry, in the, in the discipline. Um, yeah, I know <clears throat> when, um, when, when I was at TI, they went to, I was out of the research group, the group that used SBSS, but um, my group, I still used it occasionally and, and they wanted to renew the license. And I'm like, well, whatever, how much is it? And I think it was like $15,000. And I said, absolutely not. Do not in any way ever. And they still, you know, we, we did it. It just drove me nuts. But um, I totally get the, yeah. the switching to uh, open source type things. Because, um, I mean, granted, corporate America might have enough money for it. But uh, smaller yeah. companies, good God, you can't afford to do that per person, per user. It's crazy. Um, I mean, it was certainly a lot more work <laughs> to teach. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Class. Yeah. So now 
my job is a little bit easier than it was when I was trying to do that. Because uh, there are so many troubleshooting issues. I mean, when you're using auto hotkey, you're pretty, you're, you know, there's very few issues because everybody's a Windows user. But in some software, you got Windows errors and then you got Mac errors. And a lot of our students have Macs and so they're running R on the Mac and then yeah. some things don't work on one. And so it's, it, 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 it was really challenging. Um, but well, speaking of which, I know for us, when we were playing with Python, um, getting getting our even our you and my computer to to work the same things like there was different ver at the time it was 2.7 versus 3 and python right yeah. then there was the 64 bit versus 32 bit but then there were just all the different libraries and just getting it all to always work was just like holy cow it's yeah um, not easy um versus with auto hotkey my experience is it's really rare that something doesn't work which is it's great it's it's much more consistent you you have it happen but it's often it's a, a user privilege type thing if you raise the elevate if you elevate the script to the admin level often that'll take care of the issue but not not always yeah that's one thing i actually haven't uh, played around with too much um, is is that so i that's something i need to look into uh, a lot of a lot more of anyway um did Let's see. Let me know. Uh -huh. I'm looking at my list of stuff. Um, you know, you, you mentioned a couple of your your scripts at startup. Is there were there any more that you wanted to talk about what they do? Oh, that, yeah, uh, we can well, one of those main ones that I I use, and I was actually thinking about sharing this with my admin assistant as she was trying to work with two monitors the other day to show me some things, and uh, <clears throat> and it's the screen clipper. That's the one that you nope. shared with me, though. Nope. Uh, so that's nothing special for anything that maybe uh, new new viewers would be uh, exposed to, but that's to basically screen clip an image of, of some part of the screen. Um, I have my dad using that one for his, his computer at home doing certain things. Um, he loves it. Um, and he's not very computer savvy at all, but he, yeah. he wrote down how to use it and he's using yeah. it basically every day and he's, uh, looking for certain uh, house information, comparing it, but uh, there's that one. What else? Uh, do you actually? You mentioned your admin has two monitors, right? Do you do you have my? Do you use the one that will toggle the the program to the other window? Um, you know what? I have it, and that's because I've been basically uh, mostly using my laptop for so long, uh -huh. um, and I haven't really. The, the limitation with the laptop was trying to get it set up to use actually i could have anyway done it that way but i couldn't get it to use uh, two monitor two external monitors because it didn't have the capability of doing yeah. that so the only monitors to use were a laptop monitor and another monitor right. Right. and i didn't like to use the monitor where i'm looking up and looking down and looking up and look, yeah. looking down i like to look more side to side yeah. Yeah. so when i ever set that my laptop up to another monitor an external one it was usually just to replace the small laptop yeah, yeah. monitor. Right. Uh, so I have not used that, that version. Um, but one of the things that she, she ran into also was she was in a PDF file and she was trying to deal with uh, the content in the PDF file. And I know you have a screen clipper that, that actually will take the, the content and, and read the text. Um, so she couldn't do that. So she had to type in that information, but uh, yeah. But the version that would actually take the text would probably be really helpful for her. Yeah, you lose the formatting, right? But it, but it's still yeah. who cares, right? If you can, but it, yeah. <clears throat> oh, and yeah, that's right. the other. Yeah, that's the other thing too. Is uh, is one of the scripts that's running is the one that you shared, which is to paste something in plain text, and yeah. I use that one all the time. So do I. Yeah. Um, whether it's Excel or whether it's it's Word or 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 an email or or something like that. Um, I use that one a lot. And I, I think, because I think you sent it to me, but I don't use, I forget different types of audio files. Do you have one for playing music or something? Is that right? Because Yeah, um, I wrote one, I don't know, it was like two summers ago or something. It was one that uh, would play different audio files um, and would play the Windows Media, play MP3, play WAV files. And it would also... Uh, I also had it do a very rough search for uh, certain content words. Um, so uh, if I wanted to 
you know, play happy songs or something like that. You know, I type in a word happy and it would get any, any file that actually contained uh, happy in it. Yeah. So uh, yeah. you know, there's not a lot of happy songs. I'm mean, actually, yeah, oh. there's probably not that many happy songs that have the word yeah. happy in the title name. Uh, there's probably more happy songs that would have, you know, something else in the title name. Oh. But, yeah. anyway, but, you know, they weren't tagged as happy or not. Right. I mean, that would be, that would be the nicest thing. But it was a, you know, it was a, a nice way to kind of drill down. I know the way you used your media player is because you like the folders. You're like, oh, let me click on play stuff in this folder or this directory structure where I like to think of things based on the name. So it's like, okay, how I would search for it would be, yeah. oh, I want to play something by this particular band. Let me put that band in. And then it finds that band and it plays the songs uh, for that band. It ran yeah. order, not ran order or whatever. I I'm sure we, we could if we cared because um, the genre often is available right as a meta tag like type of thing and so um we could probably iterate over all of our stuff and then use the genre which would be a little bit better than just the word the, the word yeah. and the file name and yeah. that would but um, yeah. still you wouldn't have happy but you'd have yeah john blues or something rock it, it, exactly um, um, but often those are don't line yeah. up with what the actual music is so yeah you, you wouldn't probably put the blues in the happy songs anyway those <laughs> um <laughs> but <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, that would probably uh, work. I mean, it certainly works well because if I want to, you know, play something by a particular band, uh, it, it's it's easier for me to do that than to navigate to the folder that has that band. Is the uh -huh. way I think about it. So, well, um, but still, what's awesome is you know you're you, you have a hotkey. I'll bet that just pulls it up. Mm -hmm. and it, you write it to what you want, right? And that's what I love about auto hotkey is I can adapt it to how I think. Mine are all around the control shift, control shift S will skip the song, control shift D will actually delete the MP3 file. If I just go, oh my God, I hate this song, right? I can yeah. just delete it from my player um, and then I can pause it. Um, anyway, yeah, it's-, it's Yeah, I actually, uh, I built in a favorites uh, option. So I could I could favorite, put it oh, in, cool. up, up uh, a thumbs up icon uh -huh. I had. And, uh, and then basically it put that into a folder. Basically all it did was just Take the the file path of the file and through yeah. through that in you're in making a, a playlist. Yeah. So and then it made a playlist essentially. So if yeah. I want to play that favorites, right. uh, or if I want to play the favorites, then it will just go through through that and uh, randomize the order of the the items oh. in that in that uh, particular special playlist and and then also. Uh, I do think it's been a while since I've I've used that, but I I, I believe it also has. Uh, a thumbs down and I think it will do what you what you do oh, yeah. Leak, remove, remove yeah. this file yeah. although uh, sometimes I don't like doing that because if it's a file within a within an album I, even if I don't like the song I know I rarely I do it I don't yeah. want to get rid of the uh, the song uh, from your the order album. I know no I'm the same way but sometimes I'm like oh my god that's a terrible song I'd never want to hear that again yeah um, yep yeah. um Trying to think, what other uh, what other things do I? I mean, I've used the GUIs. Uh, you and I used to build GUIs, but now I use Quick Access Pop Up uh, for a lot of that. That also allows you to change your your hotkeys to activate um, certain content. Um, uh, oh, oh, one one thing uh, that is another way of automating messages. So. I get asked to write a lot of re letters of recommendation. Oh, this, sure, might yeah. little, this might be a little bit particular, um, maybe for the listeners or viewers out there. Um, but if you find yourself in a situation where you have to write letters or do something yeah. of, of that order and you have to recruit. Anyone in sales, right? You're doing yeah. that all the time. Yeah. And you have to recruit information from, from people, <laughs> you know, yeah. students, the students, even the greatest students, they don't, they don't know exactly you know, how to organize the information to send to you. Yeah. So you have 15 different schools that they're applying to. There are different positions, there are different locations, different addresses. Some of them are master's programs. Some of them are PhD programs. Some of them are jobs. Some of them are internships and, and all of that other kind of stuff. Um, and, and so I just created an Excel file that says, okay, what is the position? What is the name of the program? What is the address? Who is this supposed to be addressed to? Because maybe I'm old school, 
but I think you should address a letter to an individual. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's and much more and if I'm going to write a letter on your behalf, if I don't know who to send the letter to, then then I I, I feel a little bit weird. Um, so. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the students, too, would then have to try to find out well, who does the letter actually go to. So, but anyway, I, I basically uh, wrote, I wrote that program, which was basically a letter of recommendation uh, writer. And it would also use COM, so it would interface with, with both Excel and also with Word, because it would basically start the, the, the general format of, of the letter Yep. that I would, I would later submit. Uh, so it would all have all the information, the address, and dear so, you know, so-and-so is applying for your, you know, your uh, position, yeah, yeah. position yeah. or yeah. applying to your program for this particular degree and, and so forth. Uh, and then it would create, you know, the 15 different files. And then I could go and I could add, uh, modify those as I, as they wanted. Uh, one of the, you know, unfortunately, at that point too, is if it's a master's program or a PhD program or an internship, the letter isn't the same. So there, there is some flexibility there uh, that that I couldn't account for, unless again I had different versions of of the letter. But I'd have to write those versions of the letter for the student beforehand in order for the program to work, and uh, and sometimes you, you just you know, they don't even know that, and when they start building that that information, so. Um, and then I would just convert the files to PDFs uh, once I was done. And then I would know once they were converted to PDFs, they were files that I had sent or not. And so, um, and that was like just kind of converting, converting it to a, to a PDF meant like it was both done and it was sent because I don't send a, a, an open Word document uh, gotcha. in, yeah, in yeah. any kind of email. Yeah, PDF Word. exists, that means it's yeah. been sent. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what other things might I, I do? Do you, I, I know you, I don't know if you still have it, but um, years ago when we were doing this a lot, um, you had done a lot of web scraping for, for looking at your portfolio type stuff. Do you still have things that do that or? Uh, no, not as much. I haven't done any kind of uh, web scraping in, in a long time. Yeah, in a long time, I wanted to do some for side projects, uh, just for own, my own curiosity and stuff. But but I haven't. Uh, yeah. How about any uh, regular expressions? Do you think of any that you've? Yeah, a lot of those programs that yeah. that I I have, they definitely are you know using regular expressions to do that. But I always pull my hair out. Uh, when <laughs> that's exactly how I describe I, it too. I, I hit my head do, against the wall a couple yeah. times. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it, yeah, yeah. No matter how good you are, it's like you, you uh, don't touch it for a month. You come back and you're like, "Well, okay, I I know I know Word. Okay, slash W. Okay, I got that. After that, and st dot star. Okay, I got that. Okay, after that, I'm like, yeah, I'm. I, yeah, well, well, that that actually, yeah, that's another uh, interesting thing that uh, I haven't done use regular expressions in a while. But when I was when I was writing the program to decrapify the the yeah. class list from uh, that was given by from from the website, you know, I also didn't want to. When you download the file, it always downloads its class list. .xlsx. Yeah. Well, every file is class. Yeah. List. Right. It's yeah. Really useless, uh, right. you know, or it's going to be class. You do two, three classes. It's class list, and then it's parens one, two, three, four, right. whatever. Uh, so. I uh, use regular expression to, to capture the name of the class within the Excel document. Uh -huh. So when it actually wrote out the file, it yeah, wrote out the, year, the, the yeah. semester, the yeah. section, because yeah. sometimes you're, you may not be doing the same class, yeah. but you're doing, I'm sorry, you, uh, you know, for this, this year, I'm doing two sections of statistics, right? Mm -hmm. So just calling it statistics or, or the class ID number is not useful. So yeah. You need, yeah, you need yeah. section number. And then it's, you know, it's very specific uh, yeah. at, that, at that level. Um, so. I, and I remember actually, I think at one point, maybe I, I don't know if I introduced you to regular expressions or not, but um, we used to do a lot more, we were doing web scraping and we would go basically get all of the content on the page or like so much of it and then use a regular expression to get what we yeah. wanted. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that was where, man, when I started learning the DOM, like I stopped using regular expressions so much because I could actually grab exactly what I wanted, you know, and it was night and day. It was so helpful, so much easier in the yeah. long run. Yeah. Um, trying to look at my computer to also see some other things that might be might be running. So the, the problem is, it's like, I know, I know they're there when I need sure. to access them. Yeah, but it's, it's a thing off a of need that pops up. You're like, oh yeah, I have this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, there was that thing that I did. Yeah. Um, actually, I was thinking about one just, just last night um, as I'm moving this new computer, uh, moving to a new computer, it's like I'm trying to sync you know, files from Dropbox and Google and and sync and you know and box.com for school um and i could let the computer run all night to do that yeah. but i also didn't want to have the computer running all night so i just put it to hibernate mode but i'm like what really would be great is a script that looks for activity within those directories and if there's no activity it can shut down yeah. so it would you know it would run till two in the morning if that's what it wanted to finish Right. You know, and it would it would be it would be fine, uh, but well, and I know somebody has one for Dropbox, but there's not one because I googled for it and and found uh, somebody having one in, in on Auto Hotkey for for that, um, but they didn't have one for the others, and it was kind of beyond the scope of my understanding uh, to do it because a lot of times when I'm programming these things is is not any kind of trained programmer, um, I know, although I know some of the people you've had on your on your uh, interviews are also not trained programmers, oh, so, yeah. they're, but they're excellent programmers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little bit more slow and hunt and peck and search for a solution and okay, how to, you know, and, and, and cobbling something together that actually uh, works. But um, one, but I wouldn't have known how to do it for. Well, here's, here's one way you could think of, I, I would, uh, 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 a cheating way, right. That I would consider, especially if everything getting synced is under a certain directory right? Once a minute, go get the file size of that directory with everything underneath it, right? That's, and then That's the one thing that I was trying to do, and I realized yeah. it, it wasn't, unless it's a, the, the functionality that I was using just wasn't doing it correctly, uh -huh. um, but it, it wasn't immediate. And so it was taking, you know, quite a while to even come back with that number. Well, so, it because if it has to go each time it does it, it has to go through every file, right in there and recalculate it. That's that's why yeah. it, would, it would take a while to actually run. But but it, yeah, but if you go in Windows and you just click on the folder, you know, and you click, and it's actually kind of fast. And as well, there, you know, my Dropbox issue with over a million files. I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> now it, it takes a while and resources just to just to do that. But Maestrith, I'm trying to remember if he actually posted the forum, but he is worked with the the explorer object um in in the tran he has it where when he transfers files with dropbox the the menu with the icons showing them getting transferred will come up right so i'm like oh that's that's really neat because i can see the files literally moving you know you run an auto oh. script and say move move this and you'll see the windows pop up with the things transferring right i'm like oh that's that's neat that's why one of the reasons why he did that but my guess because he's actually accessing that object that maybe that's how it, it with the way I was first describing it, it has to go through and loop over every file and calculate it. But maybe that file object already has that value and you could pull it that way. Right. Mm -hmm. That, that might, if you weren't using the file object, maybe that's a yeah. way to, to that, get maybe it. That, that would be, yeah, that'd be a way. Um, I know one thing I did too, is my, my graduate student was working on a project um, where he had to scan PDF documents, uh, or yeah, he had to scan PDF documents um, for for looking at uh, trying to detect fraud in letters mm -hmm. uh, in the mailing system. And he could not figure out, and apparently in Python this was not easy to do, um, and people were complaining about it. There's no way to take a, a a PDF and convert it to like a Word document. So. Uh, hmm. I, I just said, well, okay, I know, and I try to, if I want, I could take a PDF and convert it to a Word document. Well, you can have Word open a PDF now. It'll actually convert it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And w yeah, natively, right? You just have to click that box the first time you do it and everything. That's right. So, yeah. um, 
which I didn't as I was testing it out, but I just, I figured, well, if I can do it that way in auto hockey, I could actually, uh, or if I could do it in Windows, I can write an auto hockey script that will actually do that, uh, run that process. Yeah. And then I can compile that. Oh, I did, and then, yeah. And then he could have that file yeah. and then he could put it in his program and then Python could just call that file on the loop. So basically that's what, that's what he did. Um, and it was just kind of a nice way of taking an auto hotkey program, making it executable and completely, uh, you know, sharing it on some other platform. So um, it was kind of a, you know, a simple solution, but it was the best way to solve the problem yeah. uh, for that, for that point. I know somebody had been working on a uh, uh, Pi AHK or something like that uh, library, but uh, I think, think that may have stopped i'm not sure Pi ahk yeah i think it was like yeah Pi ahk or something uh, what i don't know what's the Pi reference Python. oh sorry Python. Okay. Yeah, yeah it was it was a way for for you to run auto hotkey within well, python yeah well i mean i you know when i did that i i did it both ways i ran python without auto hockey and i used auto hockey with within python um within the code itself yeah. Okay. So that was, yeah, that's uh, one thing we didn't, we didn't figure out. Yeah. It, um, it was nice cause I could slice, I could, I could slice stuff in auto hotkey, right? I could use Python slicing of things. Um, and then I could use hotkeys in Python to, I could, I could hit a hotkey and it would launch my Python, you know, mm -hmm. um, code and do stuff with it. But anyway, yeah, I, I did both. Um, it's definitely doable. Um, it was, it, there were, there were little, this was like five years ago now, four years ago where I did it. Um, there were some little nuances where I was like, oh, how did I you get around this? But um, it wasn't that bad. But it was, it was one of the things of like, at the time, you're right, how did I in Python do some of the things I love about auto hotkey? How do I trigger a Python code to say, okay, now I wanna connect to my open browser and go grab something, right? And um, they had like something with send keys or something or and you could send keystroke, but but the triggering the the, the mm -hmm. paying attention to a hotkey, I forget if they if I found an alternative to auto hotkey, but then I just realized I can use auto hotkey to do that. But then I realized I can everything I wanted to do, I could do it in auto hotkey. So why am I bringing in Python in the mess yeah. in the first place? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, that was another thing too. Uh, uh, using R, there's not. There's no, it's surprisingly, there's no functionality that I've come across in the R Studio IDE that allows you to dupli duplicate a line. And as you know, whether we're huh. in Slate or we're in uh, Studio, we're in in, in uh, HK Studio, you know, you could easily duplicate a line. Yeah. So I wrote a script that when I used the same in, in the R, uh, when I was in the R console, you know, we had. Uh, Control D or whatever would would uh, yeah. um, I have to figure out exactly now I've reset things up on on this computer and I need to uh, reset it up on HK Studio because it's not it's not working properly. Right. Well, yeah, those were that wasn't a built-in uh, one. I know. I, yeah. I it annoyed me when I redid mine. I'm like, why isn't this? Oh, that was my own. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I, I basically used that same key binding yeah. in R to basically just say copy this line paste it and, and put in a return and then paste it again. Yeah. Uh, and that would yeah. you know, solve, solve that. Yeah. Hit, uh, like hit home and then end and then copy and duplicate. Yeah. I did that in one of them. And then, but the other one I've done is, um, which is awesome is the context sensitive part. So my remark for, for adding in comments, like I can, you know, when I hit REM period in auto hotkey, it'll start it off with a semicolon and then put asterisks. But in oh. Python, it was what the hell was it in Python? The, uh, the pound. Oh yeah, right. Um, but and then um, and then SQL, it was something else. And in HTML, it's the yeah. greater than, or less than, and two dashes. And just it was like, hey, I don't have to remember all that. I just type no. the same thing, and it yeah. does it for me, right? That's and that's yeah. That's one of the things I was saying in the beginning is I study memory, and memory is so fallible, and yeah. so. It's like if you can make something. That's what that's what's that's what's great about quick quick access pop up. I remember when you and I were trying to make uh, GUIs back in the day. Oh, like, yeah. I have all these, you know, I have all these snippets of code. So whether you use 
you know, when you use SPSS and if you use the drop down menu, you could go to do this and go here to analyses. What type of analysis do I want to do? And then I, you know, I can click on that analysis. And so, you know, we created our macros to do those things to simplify that. Right. So we wouldn't have to, you know, use all of the code. It would be, it would be a simplified line of code that would call a macro. But then it's like, well, how do you remember the macro? Right. right, and that's where auto hotkey comes in because the macro could just be a text expander. But yep. then you have to remember what keys to actually pull right. that up, and so then we're like, "Whoa, we can make it a GUI." Now right. you can just navigate to the GUI, and you could, awesome. you know, you could paste it. So, uh, so quick access pop up and and uh, and other options have have allowed that to be even uh, simplified. Uh, that also, I would I would um, urge people that if you are using the hot string approach, just having a naming structure that you know follows a pattern, you start grouping things. Like for me, it's the it's it, so for Gabe, it's G C E for email period, and that'll pop up. That's how I switched to your new email address you just gave me. I'm mm. like, I just swapped it out, right? I'm like, I don't have to think about it. I don't even know it. Although when I wrote yeah. it the other day on my phone, I'm like, oh, I don't have this new one in my phone, yeah. so. So I'm like, I'm going to have to make sure I write one in the phone so it's there. But yeah, um, yeah I'm well, like, don't think yeah. about it. No, I, absolutely. And and until I, you know, I might still need uh, that same email. So I didn't change mine because yeah. I use it. But but I, uh, for you, <laughs> you know, you, you only need one of my emails, right? right. Um, but for me, it's like different things are in different places. Oh, so man. I just, I just went into my code and I made a, an E0. And so that would be... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That would be the other one, but yeah, I had like five different emails, and so uh, that, that you know that's easy to to populate. And it's what's nice too is it it doesn't doesn't um, it prevents you from letting Firefox or Chrome or anything keep all that information to auto populate that stuff for you. Yeah. So phone numbers and other kind types of thing uh, you you can you can easily put in there. But because you know because memory is fallible, and just trying to remember all these things, we have so many shortcuts and that we, you know, I just don't even remember. Um, but if I need to, again, search memory myself to say, oh, I do have something. Well, if you put it all in some neat place, like quick access pop-up, yeah. then even if it's something you use once a year or twice a year, it's in there. Yeah. And yeah. you can it's navigate. Organizing and thinking about it in the first place to make sure you put it somewhere that's going to make sense yeah. to find it. Because the more and more we get, involved in this we have so many more solutions to you know uh, to do to certain things so um, you know do i want to remember the the code to launch my music program do i want to remember the code to launch this other program it's like at some point maybe you just want to create that gui that allows you to right. to navigate to the ones that that become used that are used so infrequently well, that you forget what those key bindings are because when no. you can't remember the key binding then it's completely useless anyway right so you'll love this. Um, I mentioned it to, to John on one of our calls, and in like three days later, he's like, "Hey, I, I implemented some of uh, you know what you what you came up with." Um, I said, "Wouldn't it be cool? Because like you can you can monitor in QP like how many times people use what folders is that? Like, wouldn't it be awesome?" Yeah, you wanted to have those data to to have it to have it auto suggest to say, yeah. "Hey, you go to this folder a lot. Why don't you make a hotkey for it or or a short?" Oh, so it's gonna, that? He's getting there. It's gonna. Oh. It's in the beta. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So it's it's coming. Um, ah, that's cool. Yeah. He he. I mean, right that's now he great. had the tracking. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And I'm like, man, that's gonna be encourages awesome. Encourages people because this is this yeah. deals with the same. Proactively, we yeah. Talking about is within some some narrow you know focus of of what people are doing. It can make a suggestion. Now it's coming from him. You know he can't tell what other things you're doing that are, isn't programmed to look for. But, but right. that's the thing is if you're not aware of, of yeah. using it and, and one thing we know about memory is, you know, awareness is influenced by just your, you know, your attention. Things, right? So yeah. if you're very busy at work and you're right. doing these things, you don't even have the ability to, to be aware that you're doing something over and over and over, or you actually don't remember it because you don't have any processing, mem memory processing or attentional processing. Oh, reasons. that's interesting. That's able to do it. So this is like, right. again, this is what I was saying is auto hotkey allows the environment yeah. Yeah. to kind of, and that's what QAP was doing for me anyways, allowing the environment, once I've written the program, it allows, it allows the environment, the functionality of, of the environment because QAP is written in auto hotkey. 
<laughs> so it's like that tool has allowed the environment to remind me of these things that I need to do. It's navigating to, oh, I need to run this macro. I can't remember the macro. I can't remember the text to call that macro. Therefore, it's useless. But if you put it into that GUI, then it, it brings back all that functionality um, that, that you can use. And now he's building that in the software that will suggest to you or remind you right. that you're doing these things that otherwise you're not even conscious of. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. And yeah. then that encourages the more use, which right. makes you more efficient and less, right. less frustrated at, at your job. So yeah. Uh, yeah. that's, yeah, I think that's, that's yeah. Uh, and then, you know, it's another th way to get people to keep using the software uh, because it works because it's noticing that, that you keep on going here or doing this yeah. or opening this program, opening this program and, uh, using this file or something. So I, yeah, I think that's, that's excellent. Yeah. Should be cool. Awesome. Was there anything else? I think we're, yeah, we probably took up uh, more time than yeah, well, that's right. I mean, we, we had a lot of a good stuff, but if, um, yeah, we've done yeah, a lot of stuff over the years. So there's lots of things that the other one that popped in my head was remember when we, we automated writing the Gmail. So you didn't have to log into Gmail and because you and I would write each other, it was like an instant messenger, but in Gmail, like yeah. you hit a hotkey, it would pop up. You could change the two, right? We could put a different email address in it, uh -huh. but it wasn't the webmail version, right? It was just an input box, basically in a little GUI. Yep. And uh, it was awesome. Cause we were like so quickly able to write someone a quick note. Um, saved a lot at the time for me. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, man, that I'm was nice. At, yeah. I'm looking at it right, uh, right here. Mine stopped working. I forget what it, it leveraged the CDO, whichever the, I don't even know what that was if I remember right. But, um, yeah, I, can't I don't know. I think of the, probably the security, like needing double two factor authentication or something, you know, mm. uh, uh, is probably why it ended up dying is my guess, but yeah. Um, but I, yeah, I can't think of anything right now at this, at this moment, but, um, cool. Yeah. Well, um, awesome. Thanks for yeah. being on the call. Definitely worth worth I checking out if you have the, have the time and, and, uh, an interest anyway. Yeah. And, and, uh, just, yeah, everyone keep, keep at it. You don't, you start small, baby step into it and just keep, keep adding on, you know, we don't, you never get anywhere. You don't start at the top of the mountain You start at the bottom and just slowly work your way up, but don't, don't stop. That's the other thing, right? Is keep at it. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right. Talk to you later.